everyone. Uh, welcome to our seminar, uh, Dice Sublimation Transfer versus direct to text file printing. Uh, my name is Gabrielle. I'm an application specialist at Almaki. We also have here uh, Ralph Taramaga. He's in Northeast Sales and Business Development um, from Fisher Textile. We also have Mike Terizzi. He is the managing partner at ITMH. So here's what the presentation will entail. We have an overview of dye sublimation and direct to textile printing. Um, textile digital printing workflow, market trends, printing technologies and special features, fabric media for various applications, transfers, papers for small to medium production, additional resources, and then we'll have a Q&A session right after um, this presentation. So let's just get into the dye sublimation transfer process. Um, the first step in this process is printing onto transfer paper. After that, you will move on to your um, heat pressing um, process. This is basically where the ink goes from a solid form on the paper to a gas form, basically um, step, um, skipping the um, liquid form and back onto a solid um, form onto polyester fabric. And then once that step is done, you'll move on to your finishing, which is your cut and sew of your goods. So here's an overview of the digital printing workflow. Um, the Example we have here today is a mass application. Um, there's other applications that you could create with digital printing. Um, so after you have chosen your application, you would then move on to your design CAD software. This can be Photoshop, Illustrator, or Corel Draw. Um, after that, you move on to your brick printing software. Alamaki offers Raster Link 6 and TX Link 4. TX Link is more specifically for your textile designers. But this is where you will set up your quantities, your workflow, and your color management. And after that, you will queue for printing. And this is where it enables you to do fast customization and speed to market. So here we have the e-commerce pandemic pivot. Um, this is our direct-to-consumer model. So within the last year, we have seen a huge um, growth in the e-commerce market. Um, this is where a lot of brick and mortar stores have like shipped a lot of their business online. Um, we see that the e-commerce retail sales um, hit $709 billion in 2020, and 14.5% of those sales were U.S. retail, and which was up 11% from 2019. And so if we look at the model on the left, something to take note of is the personalization. Between the traditional and digital method, we see that digital allows you to personalize your, um, your goods to consumers, and then uh, for digital, you have an increase in your speed to market. This means that you have a uh, um, higher um, turnaround when you need to um, um, basically, sorry, lost my train of thought, but uh, when you are um, actually selling direct to consumer and then you have your merchandising, which allows you to have full control of um, just the variations of products that you can create. And Gabby, I, oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Side. So, yeah, the pandemic pivot, I think part of it is because of the pandemic, but I'm also seeing a huge pivot in ability for entrepreneurs and small businesses to market on social media and on the web and using you know whether it's platforms like Instagram and you know Facebook or websites like Etsy that to me I, I attribute more of this pivot to that uh, and I think it's sort of just timing happens to you know the proliferation of those types of things just kind of coming into the pandemic which probably then put a spotlight on it because you couldn't go to a mall for, for a while. So um, so that one, you know, as a distributor for printers and getting a lot of new prospects talking to us, and that's what I see over and over is, you know, people are doing really well on Etsy and they're, they're selling uh, through social, but they want to start now printing. Uh, but so that to me is a good, good part of the pivot. Okay. So here we have the Inkjet direct to the summer model. Um, this process is really simple. So the first step is uploading your image. After that, you move on to your um, color separating catalog. This is where you separate your colors. Then you will customize your order, then you queue for printing. After that, you move on to your delivery. So as you can see, like with the um, direct to consumer model, it would take you about two days to um, do everything from like uploading your image, doing production and delivering to your consumer versus the traditional method, it would take to, um, two to three months. So what's the case? 
Um, in 2019, we have seen the global current textile market hit $146 billion, um, which was an, an, uh, anticipated to have an annual 8.9 pound annual growth for 2025. Um, and of that, uh, digital printing textiles is six to seven percent. Um, and a digitally printed textile, it has a compound annual growth of 29 percent. And of that is um, dye sublimation, it has a compound annual growth of 10.7 percent. Um, so if you look at the models on the left and you compare the two, traditional printing process is like more labor intensive stuff. You have your production of your artwork. Um, and then you move on to your approval stage where you will separate your colors, you will do your you know, engraving of your screens, um, and then that will move on to printing your strikes off. Uh, so if your strike off is approved, you will move on to production. However, if it's not approved, you will have to start over. And that can take you know, three months. As far as digital printing process, you can do design, production, and print your strike off within like a couple of days and then be able to move into production. So, um, so here we have the Mamaki dye sublimation technology family. We offer printers um, basically for all different production needs. Um, for consumers, we have our um, newly entry level printer, the TS100, 1600. Um, this is our 64 inch printer. This is great for anyone who is interested in really starting a dye sublimation business or wanting to diversify the business. Um, next up, we have the TS200. Um, this is great for small to medium production. We also have the TS55-1800. Um, this is our medium to large production printer. We have the TS500P, which is for your more large to industrial runs. And then last, not, last but not least, we have the Tiger machine, which is for high volume production. So let's take a look at the sportswear and athleisure market. Um, the U.S. sportswear sales makes up 36.8% of the global market, um, and it's expected to have a growth of $251 billion by 2026. We also see that 75% of athleisure and sportswear was polyester fabric. So just looking at these numbers, um, dye sublimation will be like the ideal workflow um, for this application. So when you talk about swim and beachwear market, we see that the swimwear market hit 19.5 billion US dollars in 2020, um, and it's expected to have a 5.1 compound annual growth in 2027. And something else to take note of is like when you're um, really printing swim and beachwear, like these this application can be printed in like smaller um, production style and you have a wide range of variations that you can print which makes it really ideal for um, dye sublimation. Yeah so generally um, people think Fisher Textiles only has um, products for graphics, display, soft signage, stuff like that, flags, but we do have an apparel line and up there is some um, examples of fabrics you know we make a material that uh, people are using to make yoga pants um, certain like uh, boy shorts and Hawaiian shirts and then we do have spandex that we use for a variety of different applications um, we actually have a, uh, a whole sample book full of different fabrics for apparel so if you guys want one of these you can pick it up All right, so look at, let's look at this one and beach wear workflow. Um, there are two workflows that you can utilize for this application. Um, the first workflow is showing you how to go from our work printing software um, into um, your printing process. After that, you can use a calendar press to heat, uh, transfer your design to polyester fabric. And so with this workflow, you're able to step and repeat your pattern within the RIP software print directly um, to transfer paper, heat press your designs and fabric, and then you can move them to your cutting operation. And this is where you can cut out all your pattern pieces. And then you would use a um, overstitch or cover stitch sewing machine to sew your garment. The second workflow is showing you how to start off with your pre-cut fabric pieces. Um, you can upload your quantities in the work print software and then print them using a TS-100 onto transfer paper and then transfer your design onto your, um, your fabric. And then once that is completed, you can move into your cutting operation and cut out your pattern pieces and then um, sew your goods.
Next, we're going to talk about the promotional and personalized market. Um, there are two categories for this market. Um, this is the branded products. This is where you can um, bring your company's logo and offer that to you know existing or you know new consumers. Um, the other category is customizing and personalizing you know different things for consumers. And here we see that you know sign shops expand their business. Um, by using, you know, promotional and personalized applications. And this can be like tote bags, mugs, and stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. So we usually only have uh, rolled goods uh, here and, um, you know, cut. So recently we got into the blanket market. And so we do have uh, rolled goods of different, a couple different types of blanket materials. But we did also um, start carrying. Um, Blanks, basically already cut and sewed blanks that you can sublimate to on a flatbed heat press, and you can you know you can do both sides. Um, and we have two varieties of these kind of blankets that we sell. And um, we also you know so we sell fabric for different applications, tote bags, um, and uh, you know obviously some jersey type fabrics for other um, types of promotional. So here we have the workflow for promotional and personalized applications. Um, the first workflow is just showing you how you can upload your quantity of um, coasters, um, key footprint using the TS100, and then you would use like a time show heat press if you have a smaller production. If not, if you're thinking more of like industrial production, we, um, there's like the flatbread uh, heat presses that you can use where you can send like thousands of parts in. Um, and then you will have your personalized coaster um, after that process. The second workflow is more for like your um, your branding of your business. Um, you can print directly to the transfer paper. Let's say you're creating a mug, then you'll have your um, your um, mug press um, right before you, well after you print, and then you have your branded mug. All right, so let's talk about the soft signage application. Um, soft signage, you can do silicone edge graphics, your back lid, your front lid. Um, in the last year, we've seen like a lot of um, companies putting their backdrops and having that behind them as they're doing virtual events or just conference calls. Um, so this is a market that we're going to talk about. So. Yep, silicone edge graphics. So does everybody know what that is? Um, did you have oh. a slide that talks about that? Uh, I think the next slide. Next slide, okay. Yeah. So Gabby's going to go over that, but you can see a bunch of different examples of uh, what you can do with silicone edge graphics. This one's backlit, these are backlit. Um, you know, pretty much all of our like artwork on the wall is uh, SEG frames. And um, actually after we, we have a uh, person representing Rep Rex frames here who sells the frames, and he can explain a little bit about that. Um, you know how that goes as well um, but we have a variety of fabrics we have uh, fabrics that are specifically made uh, for backlit because uh, that introduces some problems usually if it's not the right fabric like you'll see little white spots they call them pinholes and you'll see hot spots where the lights are so it's got to be this like you know perfect fabric that's got just the right amount of, of opacity you know to allow the light to come through but you know still look nice and smooth like that um, and then we do have a couple of different flag materials depending on whether you want to do a, a two-sided flag with a liner in the middle or a feather flag where you want it to print through to the other side. So here's the silicone edge graphics workflow. Um, the panel we have here is a TS55 um, for this application. Um, so once you're done printing, you move on to using your calendar press and then move on to your um, cutting operation where you cut out your soft with self signage graphics, and then you would use a kind of sew machine to sew um, the silicone edge on all four sides of your fabric. Papa, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I think I think later on Steve can get into some of the okay. specifics about making SEGs and whatnot. Okay. That that's the basics. Okay. So next, we're going to talk about the home decor and fashion workflow. Um, when you're talking about home decor, we would recommend using a printer that's 64 inches and up just for applications like curtains, um, pillows, 
drills and stuff like that. Um, that would be like an ideal printer to use um, just to meet the you know industry standards. So once you have printed your application or your, you know your design on transfer paper, you can move on to your calendar press and then your cutting operation. And then you'll just use a comma sew or a single needed middle um, single needle machine to sew with your goods. So let's talk about the sample to volume production printers. Um, we newly released the TS100, 1600, that's the machine that's downstairs. Like I said, it's a great machine to use, especially if you're wanting to get into the die sale business or just want to diversify your portfolio. We also have the TX model, uh, which is downstairs as well. Um, this is our world's first die sale um, transfer and direct to fabric. And here's just the key features of the TS100. Um, this machine comes up with a teacup reel. Um, we also have one liter SB610 bottles that we offer with this machine as well. Um, it comes with all of our Milwaukee port technologies, which we'll get into a little bit later. And here's just um, another um, slide with our dice information printer portfolio. We have the TS300P. Um, it comes with a two liter Milwaukee bulk ink system, um, the automatic media tension bar, which helps stable or um, helps with stabilizing your media as you're printing. Also comes with a platen vacuum. And then we have the TS55, which is medium to large production printer. Um, it comes with a 10 liter Milwaukee ink, uh, bulk ink system. And we also offer the McKinney Jumbo Bowl unit, which you can save like 30% of your calls with this option. We also have the large to industrial production printer, the TS500P. Oh. Okay, so this basically goes over our traditional business, which is our display products, retail products, um, you know, the flags and stuff. One thing I, I wanted to mention after, um, I, we should, should have probably put it in the slide after your home furnishings one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, during the pandemic, we were looking for alternatives because the trade shows were canceled. So all our trade show business went away and it was a big chunk of business. So we found that um, a lot of our uh, fabrics could be used for other other home furnishing type applications. Like, you know, this is an example of a pillow with one fabric. Um, I'm pretty sure, you know, we, and we have a couple of uh, waterproof fabrics that people are using so they make outdoor pillows custom you know upholstered cushions for outdoors and stuff like that and then we you know have a different type of fabric this fabric here that was originally meant to do like um the cubicles and stuff but also it felt polycube but it makes a nice little textured pillow so we found that a lot of the fabrics could be used for uh home furnishings as well so we put together a uh, sample book specifically with fabrics that we think would be really good for home furnishing applications so if you guys want one of these, they're up here too. Okay. So with DICEP, of course, you will need your sublimation papers. And one of our media partners that we work really close with is um, Beaver Paper. Um, they offer um, rolls of transfer paper in sizes 24 inches to um, 126 inches for all your um, DICEP printers. And so now we're going to get into the direct to textile printing. All right, so everything we've talked about so far is dye sublimation, all things polyester. Polyester is a fabric or a fiber type that the chemistry of dye sub apes works really well with. And so we can get away with printing on the paper and then e transferring to fabric, which is nice because it's a, it's a little bit more of a simple straightforward printer to have just a, a paper printer versus one that can handle uh, printing on fabric directly uh, but in certain cases we're going to talk about when we need to or want to print onto the uh, fabric directly and there's a few instances uh, major instances and the first one is when we're dealing with fiber types beyond polyester if we're not printing on polyester then we cannot do the dye sub process it's not going to work so we have to use a different ink chemistry that will work. And there are a few others that we're gonna go over, but they all require direct printing on the fabric. Also, when it does come to polyester, there are a few instances where we do wanna print uh, onto, onto the polyester. So we're gonna get a little bit into that as well. 
So first off, let's talk a little bit about some of the similarities and differences when you're going direct to the fabric or you're printing on the paper. In both cases, you know, when we, especially when we work with new, folks new to textile printing, they always want to know, can they get away with, you know, a single step process? Is there, you know, any, any magical solution where you can just print and be done? And we're going to talk about one outlier this afternoon a little bit, but generally the answer is no. We'll talk about our traditional textile applications, especially uh, beyond soft signage. Uh, you have to go through the traditional textile ink chemistry, and they're all multi-step processes. Okay, so regardless of whether you're printing on paper and transferring, or you're printing direct to the fabric, it's still going to be a multi-step process. And for each of the ink chemistries, we'll get a little into you know high level what those steps are. Uh, and they both offer, whether you're going through dyes or you're printing direct with other chemistries, you're going to get permanent washable goods either way. It's not sampling, it's not, you know, so you're going to wind up with goods that you can cut, sew, and, and sell. Uh, some of the differences, uh, when you're printing direct, you're going to have to coat your fabric. And there's going to be one small exception about that that we'll talk about, but generally speaking, all of these inks that we're going to talk about today uh, for textile ink chemistries with water-based inks. And that means whatever we're printing to has to have a coating to control the ink dots from wicking and bleeding and allow that water and the ink to evaporate. Um, and so people say, well, how come when I dye sub, I don't need coated fabric? Well, it's because the paper was covered. And that did the trick to help that you know, hold the dot nice and tight while the water and the ink evaporated. By the time you do your heat transfer, that, that water's evaporated, you have dry ink, so you don't have to worry about migration with the ink. But when you print directly onto the fabric, you have to have something on the fabric that's gonna control the ink from just making a mess before it dries. And so, and then there's also in some cases some other ingredients that are gonna help the, the subsequent steps of the finishing. Um, so there's some other chemical ingredients to those coatings. Um, and then the last difference, or, or major difference anyway, is that your direct to fabric printers are going to be a little bit more involved and there's a little bit more going on there than a simple paper printer. So we're going to get into, you know, a couple of the major styles of direct printers and why you would use one versus the other. So when it comes to, to the polyester, there's a few instances that we want to print direct. And uh, the first major instance of when you would choose to print direct to the polyester instead of transfer is flags. If you're expecting deep ink saturation to the back of the fabric, you need the water and the ink to act as the vehicle to pull the color down. And so if you try to do that with a you know, dye sublimated flag with heat transfer, it's going to stay very topical because the ink's already dry and there's nothing that's going to pull it down. But if we print directly on a flag fabric with water-based ink, it's going to go through, the, through the, the, the flag and produce color on the back side. Also, we talked a little bit about some of these uh, SEG frames and uh, when they're back with, um, a lot of users uh, will agree that you get deeper saturation and better color when you print directly on the fabric and get deeper saturation into the fiber. Um, if it's not backlit like these, maybe a little bit less of an issue, but when it comes to this kind of stuff, I mean, you can see, you're probably uh, betting that, that that one was printed directly, and you can see how deep that black is, um, and you're not seeing light come through there. So um, that's why. Um, sometimes even uh, in the bathing suit market, same thing, it's desirable to print directly onto the fabric so that you get the deeper saturation when it stretches a little bit. Um, you still have good, you know, start to see white in the fabric. If it's a very topical print, you're more likely to see some white as it stretches. Um, so, so that one is also sometimes preferred to go direct. Um, the last one is that when you need super high light fastness, there's one type of dye sub ink, it's called a high energy ink, that you cannot print on paper and heat transfer. I can't tell you why, as the chemist will tell you why. It doesn't matter at the end of the day, to use the high energy dye sub inks, or they call them dispersed dyes is technically what they're called. Um, they need to be printed directly on the fabric. And Someone we're, told me that it won't come off the paper. Yeah. Just for whatever reason, <laughs> it sticks. It, it won't release from the paper onto yeah. the fabric, so. And so uh, it, when you print directly onto the polyester, it's still gonna be 
a two-step process. We're still going to send that printed fabric through the heat press. It's still going to sublimate because that's the chemical process that's happening, but it's not going to transfer because the ink's already there. Uh, but you still do have to have that post-printing sublimation process. And, um, and so the, the kind of customers that would want to use a real high energy ink like that, um, not even so much the flag uh, guys, because for a lot of them, you know, the flag's deteriorating probably faster than the, the color of the ink. Uh, but you think of like outdoor patio furniture, um, auto interiors, uh, where they're um, really expecting high life fastness to, to hang in there for years of use when you're getting hammered by the sun. Um, Maybe marine applications? Yeah, marine, yeah. <laughs> That's another big one, you know, that uh, sun beats on boats. So, um, so yeah, so that, that's a little bit of the difference of direct versus transfer when it comes to the polyester. So there's a few pros and cons when we're dealing with whether to decide to print direct onto a poly or to transfer. Uh, one, the very first thing you see is that transfer printing is going to have better quality. Um, that is true, but it kind of starting to split hairs a little bit because usually fabric is dimensional enough where you really can't see the difference. But at the end of the day, when we're printing ink onto a smooth paper that's coated, it can really hold those dots nice and tight. When you're printing on a dimensional fabric, even though it's coated, when the dots hit each fiber, you know, it's, it's bending around the fiber a little bit and so forth. So after everything's said and done and you put the same print next to itself, one that's uh, transferred, one that was printed direct, you will see that the transfer print will be a bit sharper and a little bit crisper. Um, if you looked at one and then looked at the other and they weren't together, it'd be very difficult. Um, but that is, um, that is a, a one that, that people will talk about on occasion. One other thing, um, the coatings have gotten much better on the fabrics to help Right. that minimize that difference right so the coatings we use here at fish are very good and can hold even if you throw too much ink on it it won't bleed right the coating will hold it together right so it's kind of really tighten it up yeah more yeah so it's it closer yeah um but on the con you'll see that you're not going to get the penetration that we talked about it's going to stay very topical and it's not going to saturate deep into the fiber um, Another one that some people talk about with the papers is that you're, you know, you're basically you're using the paper. It's a, it's a tool in the process and it gets thrown away. So, you know, some people prefer to buy a fabric printer and buy coated fabric and then save the paper. You're not buying the paper. You're not paying to ship the paper. You're not paying to dispose of the paper. Um, so that's something to consider. Uh, of course, you're going to pay a little bit more for a coated fabric versus a non-coated fabric. And then you might have to deal with whether or not you have to wash the coating out and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Um, so yeah, so we, we, I think talked about most of these things, but the big thing is the ink saturation um, is the main difference. And then you can talk about the image quality a little bit. Yeah, so like I said, we have uh, developed uh, direct print coatings here at Fisher that work really well. Um, you know, I, I believe they work better than some of our competition. So we also have a whole line of direct printable fa uh, fabrics, you know, depending on what your application is. Um, and Mike's going to go through like some fabrics, even though even if they're direct print coated, would not really work for direct printing. And he'll go over those cases, but we do have a whole line of fabrics for that. So some of the other ink chemistries for non-polyester fiber types, uh, we have basically three major groups to talk about after dye sub. So dye sub is the first major group of, of textile ink. Uh, and the next one I want to talk about is called reactive dye. And all of these inks, I, I think I mentioned, I'll say it again, they're all water-based ink technologies. So um, they're all, you know, the, all the printers are very interchangeable. Um, and what, type of ink chemistry you put in it because it's basically all the same water-based technology. Um, reactive dye is, is very much used for natural fibers. It, it, so your cellulosic fibers like your cotton and your linen and then the, the engineered ones like rayon and, and modal uh, works wonderful. Also the protein like wool. So for all of those things, um, 
reactive dyes is a, is a great uh, process. What looks amazing. We sell very little of it. Why? Because it's a much more involved four-step process. It's a little bit more expensive to get into, and it's also, um, you know, a little bit more comprehensive to get your arms wrapped around. Um, and so I just like to preface that. I want to go over it so everyone knows about it. Um, but uh, to, to kind of tell you what we see, we, you know, as a printer seller, we start a lot of reactive dye conversations, but we end very infrequently with a reactive dye sale because once people start crunching the numbers and they look at the investment and the, you know in, in certain cases the, the what the learning curve is going to be they decide that it's, it's not for them but in some cases it's really truly what fits the bill and what has to be done it's going to require pre-treating the fabric uh, and that's going to have that anti-migrant coating in there to keep the, the, the water nice and tight um, but it's also going to have a couple other <coughs> ingredients to help the post process uh, once it's coated, now we can go to a direct to fabric printer and print it. Instead of using a heat press and doing a dry heat fixation, we actually have to use what we call a steamer. And it's, it's another heat device. It's, it's a big box that the fabric will go up and down and, and through and, uh, and it's going to be hot in there. But there's a steam component that's, again, chemically required to allow that fixation to happen. Um, we usually will superheat the steam to, you know, like 225 or so, so it kind of takes a little bit of the moisture out of it, which is ironic, I think, but uh, we want to dry steam. <laughs> uh, once it's steamed, we're not done yet. We need to wash it. Dye sublimation on poly gives us a 100% ink fixation. No ink's coming out of that, or it shouldn't. Reactive dyes on cottons and, and linens and so forth, not the case. The first time you wash it, color is going to come out. And it depends on the exact coating, it depends on the exact cotton and the ink. You might get 5% to come out, it might be one, more of the, the blues and cyans versus the, the reds and yellows. Um, but that has to be done before it's in your customer's hands. The other thing that's going to wash out is the pretreatment. It's done its job, you don't need it anymore, it's going to come right out. It's going to soften the hand back up on the fabric a little bit. Um, but that's so. All four steps are absolutely required. There's no getting around them. There are a couple of resellers in the country kind of similar to Fisher that focus on the cotton. So instead of pre-treating it yourself and having to buy the equipment to do that, you can uh, buy pre-treated fabric just like Fisher offers all their pre-treated polyester. Um, but it's, um, it, you know, obviously it's a, it's a cost to have it coated. Acid dye, almost identical to the um, reactive dyes, except acid dyes are traditionally used for nylon, and you can also silk. Silk is that sort of wild card that you can use reactives or acids. So usually people <laughs> will pick which one they want to use based on if they want to go towards cottons as well or towards nylons. Um, the big applications for acid dyes in this country are flags. When we talk about polyester flags, we're talking about a lot of retail flags, like your Dunkin' Donuts teardrop and your car dealerships and, and all those types of things and the trade show flags. Um, but when you think of a U.S. flag or state flags or you know National Guard flags, all the governmental you know stepped flags, there is a somehow Dupont snuck in <laughs> back when they invented nylon that flags need to be nylon, and so I think there's a certain group of flag printers in this country that are very happy with that. Uh, they know that acid dye printing it presents a lot of barriers to entry and they have the market to themselves basically. Uh, but when you buy a nylon flag, this is exactly how it's done. They used to use uh, flat screen presses, uh, big long table presses to, to make these flags. But I, as far as I know, virtually all of them now are digital. So if you buy a, a, a nylon flag, that is going to be you know, your U.S. flag, your state flag. It's going to be done exactly like this. They pre-treat the fabric. They're going to print uh, directly to it. And they're going to steam and wash it. Oh, well, one more thing. And then the other big market that you'll see, uh, it would be uh, uh, silk. So in, uh, not so much in this country, but in Italy, for example, they do, they have thousands of printers and the Macchio told me years and years ago, the first place they ever had a thousand printers in one region was in Como, Italy, uh, back in like 2004. 
they had over a thousand TX2s, were the printer of the, of the day, uh, placed in Cuomo and they were all doing silk. Silk ties, silk accessories, uh, and the Italians are just very much into that. Uh, and then the last one would be bathing suits. We can dye sublimates of polyester bathing swimwear, but nylon is also very big. And if you want to print nylon swimwear, this is the process. <clears throat> what is much more popular for non dye sub direct printing is textile pigments. And pigments are a little bit different from a dye, which gives them a different workflow and it gives them some different characteristics. And first, I always like to compare dyes to pigments. So the first three inks that we talked about, dye sub inks, reactants, and acids, all dye. Pigments are different. They're sort of their own little group. Think of dye like Kool-Aid and think of pigment like orange juice. The Kool-Aid is going to be bright and vibrant, usually very vivid colors, but it's also translucent. When you put your hand behind a glass of Kool-Aid, you'll see your hand. Think of pigments like your orange juice. The color is a little bit more subtle, not quite as vivid, but much more opaque. You put your hand behind a cup of, of orange juice, you just see the orange juice, right? So that's kind of how this is between textile pigments and, and the dyes. Pigments can really print to anything. If they have what we call a textile binder in them, which is basically heat activated glue. So in the post-processing, when it gets the heat, it's going to essentially glue itself and become permanent to the fabric. So that will work on anything. But what it works best with, because again, it's water-based ink technology, is uh, cellulosic fibers that, are, that can handle some ink. So the cottons and the linens and the, and the rayons and stuff like that. Um, that's really where we can get the most ink down to get the most color. If we have to restrict the ink, then it's less color. Um, and textile pigments can be a two or three step process. Believe it or not, this is the, the exception when I talked about having to pre-treat your fabric. Pigments are a little bit different in that we don't have to, to pre-treat. They'll work just fine. We're gonna get great quality um, and uh, usability out of it without pre-coating it. However, if you do pre-coat it or you buy pre-coated fabric, you'll usually get better color. That coating is keeping the pigments up a little bit higher onto the fiber and it's presenting better color. And a lot of uh, the Mamaki samples downstairs, I think are actually on pre-coated fabric. Um, so that's an optional step, but really what we're doing from there is a very simple two-step process. We're gonna print directly on the, on the material uh, with the directed fabric printer, and then we're going to dry heat fix it. So this is super popular because a lot of people who do polyester like to then add the pigment um, to their portfolio because now they can do all their natural fibers. They still use their same exact heat press. All you're gonna do is you're gonna turn down your heat and you're gonna increase your dwell time. Uh, so it, you, generically, we like to say that uh, dye sub happens for 40 seconds around 400 degrees. And then pigments are like to be, you know, more like low 300s, anywhere from 310, 320. Uh, more for like 75 seconds, maybe a little bit longer if you have to. I try to keep it down so it's not taking too long. Um, so uh, no steaming, no washing. The only reason you might choose to wash the pigments is if you did pre-treat it and you felt it was necessary to get that, that treat that coating out. Um, again, anytime the coating comes out, it's gonna soften that hand back up just a, a little bit. In some applications, people are more sensitive to than others. Uh, generally, the coatings have gotten much, much better than they used to be, so it's a, a less of an issue. Um, the economic ROI on this looks way, way better when you look at printing on natural fibers. So for all the people that get super excited about reactive dyes, when they actually look at the effect, problem is that there's no steamers and washers that are any good that are entry level. You got to go to like, I won't say factory level, but you got to go closer to kind of getting something on a, on a factory level of investment. Like, you know, to get into reactive dye printing for anything less than six, seven hundred thousand dollars is, is really not practical. Whereas getting into pigment printing is a small fraction of that and just a simpler workflow with no water, which is nice. Uh, so, um, so that really 
uh, when we look at the market in this country, obviously polyesters are amazing, where they're everywhere, dye sub is giving them so much, and then the pigments are right there next. You know, another big, big market when you look at the um, custom printed digital uh, t-shirt market, uh, there's thousands of, of inkjet t-shirt printers in this country and they all use textile pigments. There's no, people aren't gonna start coding and steaming t-shirts to try to make a print on a t-shirt much easier to just use pigments and then hit it with a heat press and you have a sellable t-shirt so pigments technology have gotten so much better probably in thanks to the t-shirt market because it is so huge uh, so the roll to roll pigment printing also got that boost um, mamaki makes more than just four colors um, they have extra like it's red and blue to help boost that that pigment um, color gamut up as much as we can and it's become pretty popular. And we talked about the coating kind of giving a, a color color boost. Might be you know, a little bit exaggerated on the screen, but it makes the point that uh, the coated fabric, you will, you'll keep the color up higher and it will have a, um, a, a higher color value. But gotta be a little careful with these coatings because we don't want to affect the durability negatively. You still have to make sure your docking results look good and, and that the pigments aren't too high and can come off. Uh, so, uh, but coating definitely will boost your color. And then, yeah, we, I think we basically talked about this. Same, same goes for the dispersed dyes. If you want, if you need to or want to use the high energy inks or you want to print flags, this is your process. We basically talked about that. You're going to pre-treat your polyester, print with uh, direct dispersed dyes or your high energy dispersed dyes, and then use your heat press to, to uh, sublimate. So once we know we have to print directly onto the fabric, it's different than paper printers because there's a couple of different types of fabric printers. There's one that we have downstairs that uses the dancing bar and the tensioner uh, to, to keep the fabric taut from the back of the machine to the front of the machine. And then there's another type of printer that we call a sticky belt printer, which we don't have here today, but you see that it's kind of tough to tell in the picture. If you're up close, you can see it uses a belt to bring fabric through the printer instead of a bunch of tension bars. So just like your, your groceries go through the checkout at the grocery store, there's a belt that will carry the, the fabric right through the printer and then go back down around again. Uh, and it has a low tack adhesive on it. So as your fabric comes off the unwinder and it gets pressed down by a roller bar onto the sticky belt, it basically gets stuck there and then it gets pulled by the belt all the way through the printer until it gets peeled off and then wound up. The reason that we would need to use that printer versus a more simple printer is for knits. Your circular knit, cotton jersey knit, interlock, trico fabrics, all that stuff, you, we can't print directly to them with a, a more simple dancing bar printer because the salvages are going to curl up, the fabric's going to start to stretch, it gets stuck down into the gripper bar. You have to babysit it, and usually you waste fat, a ton of fabric trying to make it happen. The sticky belt printer is also good for really delicate fabrics, even if it's a woven fabric, if it's a delicate silk or something. We find that the sticky belt printers work just a little bit better. It's a little bit more of a comprehensive machine. It's a Mamaki has hit the nail on the head by creating this particular one that's it, very compact and easy to use relative to the big ones out there. Most sticky belt printers are north of $500,000 and they just get very big. Um, Mamaki was able to engineer one that uh, is sub 100,000. Right now they're running a great promotion on it so it's even more uh, easy to, to purchase. But it still does require plumbing. The belt has to actually get washed as it goes under because you might print right through the, you know, if it's a, a sheer fabric or, or a lighter weight fabric, you might get ink coming right through the fibers and onto the belt. And if it doesn't get washed, then ink's gonna come right back up and hit the fabric and uh, that's behind it and, and ruin it. Um, and you can also print straight to the edges on it as well. You might print over because there's no media clips because it's just stuck to the belt. Um, so for a few reasons, and also the lint on the fabric that gets stuck to the belt gets washed off as well. So, so this type of printer would, would require some plumbing and also a drain so that you can send water to the little washing apparatus underneath it. Um, but that's why, so when we're dealing with wovens and we're dealing with the decor market that's very woven centric, 
this printer works really well in the apparel world where there's so many knits and much more delicate fabric sometimes that's where the sticky belt printer um, comes in handy and what I, I I get a lot of phone calls from folks that are in the, that really want to get into the apparel market and they uh, really want to do cotton and I just I urge them I say unless you're ready to buy that printer and deal with um, you know that versus a more simple Daiso printer you know I urge you look at how many polyesters are out there the beauty of printing on paper is you don't have to worry about the more sophisticated printer you can send any knit polyester through the heat press that's okay it's not a, not a problem one way or the other but when you're dealing with your knitted um, fabrics that you're going to print direct to you have to you have no choice but to go to the more comprehensive printer. so um, it's just something that I, I urge people to really consider what their priorities are and you know we don't want to talk them into one thing or another we just want to set them up for success and especially when you're starting and we want to see people succeed and um, and, and so we try to take the 20 some odd years of experience and, <laughs> and and guide them as best we can but both of them do uh, do exist. Does the sticky belt work for <clears throat> regular cotton as well? Yeah, you can certainly so send wovens to... through it too. It's all, all day long. It's uh, um, so it's uh, that machine is capable of printing anything, mm -hmm. any construction type of, of fabric, woven, knit, whatever. Um, so yeah, that it's not just knits. Mm -hmm. um, but when you do have to do knits directly, then that's that's what we want. All right, so we're going to talk about the TX300P Mark II. Um, this is a warm printer for all textile application. So basically, this slide is showing you all of like you know visuals. We'll give you guys a visual of like what applications you can create with it. So here's a picture of the machine. Um, it is a hybrid. Well, we offer the hybrid um, functionality here, where you can print directly to transfer paper. Um, so what you do through printing directly to transfer paper, it will come with a vacuum platen storage, um, and that is easily to just tap into the printer. If you're not printing with um, transfer paper, you can easily store it here under the machine, and then you can begin printing directly to transfer paper. It comes with a media take-up device as well. There is no um, post heater present, um, but there is like third-party heaters that you can you know use um, externally. Um, and also comes with a take-up bar. Yeah, we kind of just oh, yeah, chime yeah, in on yeah. this one again. Yeah. So hybrid printer, I just we just talked about for the last half an hour how there's direct fabric printers and then there's paper printers. Mamaki engineered one that's capable of doing both, and that's that's what this hybrid mm -hmm. printer is. And I, I was telling the group yesterday I was highly skeptical when they released this because it's not the first time that a printer manufacturer has tried to release a hybrid printer including Mamaki, who's tried in the past, and they've all failed, and it's been a disaster, frankly. And then they released this, and I'm like, oh God, here we go again. But I have to say, once we learned about it and saw what they did, it's actually a highly, highly effective uh, printer. You can see they got the eight ink channels on the top, so you can divide that in half. You have four uh, for direct printing, and then four for sublimation on paper. And as Gabby pointed out, changing your vacuum platen in and out um, is very simple and kind of not to toot our own horn, uh, <laughs> but last uh, summer, fall last year, um, Amazon Prime approached us to help them support the season two of Making the Cut show, which is the Heidi Klum, Tim Gunn, formerly Project One Way show. Uh, they were shooting it in California over the course of like five weeks and they really wanted us to help them uh, you know support their designer contestants with on-site on-demand inkjet printing so they could dream up their designs and instantly get prints and they asked us what what printer do you think would make sense for you guys to, to bring and help support the show and you know I said this is the one because with one machine, one printer, and then one heat press, we can uh, give the contestants immediate access to any polyester and a lot of different cottons and natural, and we even did some silk. Um, obviously, we were we are limited with the wovens. When we print direct, this is not a belt printer, so it's gotta be woven fabric. Um, we actually did have one knit. If you, if you can order knit fabric paper back, 
It's not ideal for production, but for short run projects, the paper basically acts like the belt. And so if you run the fabric with the paper backing, um, it's almost like the backing of a sticker. Uh, you can run it right through this machine. And so we did that as well. Um, we were asked, so they had, we printed at night for them uh, because the designers work all day, we get to work all night. Um, and we were constantly having to go back and forth between cotton and poly and cotton because they'd be, get one job in and the next designer submits a job and we're like halfway into one. And then we were, I mean, we must have gone three or four times a night back and forth right. between printing cotton and then polyester, you know, doing the dye soap paper. And uh, this machine, it took us you know, maybe five minutes to change over. Heat press was a little, we had to wait a little bit longer to let the temperatures keep going up and down. Um, but it really, really was impressive for, for someone looking to cast a real wide net of what they can say yes to for a customer and keep it to one machine. Um, this is a really, really wonderful printer. We've been so happy with it. All right, so here's a visual of the hybrid functionality ink system. So um, with this ink system, you can have a SV411, which is more for like, you know, your sportswear, high-end um, athleisure wear, self-good home furnishing and self-signage um, that would be done with um, transfer solution. Then you also have an option to do direct sublimation with their SV420 inks for soft signage or apparel made out of polyester fabrics. And then we also offer pigment inks, um, which will be used for like home furnishing, which would be your cotton, bamboo, hemp, linen. So this is how you will switch over from your fabric to your paper. Um, so if you're basically printing on uh, basically a uh, fabric you would just ditch your platen and so here you see like there's the ink channel that you have here um, so you don't need the vacuum platen and if you're printing directly to transfer you would just snap in this platen here and then you will you know put your paper on your machine so when it's not in use you would just store it right underneath your printer yeah super easy yeah super easy and Mike kind of went over this earlier. Um, this is just a more in-depth um, chart of like just the different ink sets that um, we recommend for each application. We have acid, reactive, textile, dispersed dye, um, dye sublimation for direct to fabric, and gas sublimation for paper transfer. And here's just a list of applications that you can create. And this is just your um, your ink and fiber types that are you know compatible with each other. Of course, your reactor inks are going to be for your natural fibers um, and some of your protein fibers. Then you have your acid, which is more for your protein fibers. And then you have your pigment, uh, which allows you to basically print on all types of fibers. But of course, um, if it's something other than natural fibers, we would recommend that you do testing. And then you have your dispersed for your your synthetic fibers. And I know that, uh, first of all, this, mm -hmm. uh, this, this is a typo, and that is definitely a nylon that's not compatible for mm -hmm. any time. But, um, but the, yeah. Yeah. acid ink, you know, I said everything is water based, and acid ink kind of sounds bad, but it's, it, it's water based ink. It's just a little bit more acidic, acidic on the pH scale of the ink, and that's what they named it. Uh, but, uh, but it is water based ink, because people hear that like, well, it's, it's fine. So we're just going to go over a couple of core technologies. Um, these technologies are inherent in all of our Milwaukee printers. So the first technology is the nozzle check unit and the nozzle recovery system. So with the NCU, like as you're printing, if there's any nozzles missing, um, it will go directly into a cleaning. Um, if the, and then once it's done cleaning, it will continue printing. Um, if these nozzles cannot be, um, you know, it's we have recovered, that's a word, recovered, then uh, you can turn on the nozzle recovery system and it will recover your nozzles and then you can resume printing. Can I just? Yeah, 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 absolutely. yeah absolutely. No, you're fine. <laughs> so, Mamaki, Gabby's going to go over a lot of the, the core technology of Mamaki. That's really what, in my opinion, separates uh, Mamaki from virtually every other wide format brand out there. Really, really have so much going on under the hood to help the users. and. You know, we do events and we do trade shows historically. 
where we get the big three questions. The big three questions usually are, you know, how big is the printer? How fast is the printer? And how expensive is the printer? And they're all important questions, but what people don't always understand, because then they're going to go to the next booth and ask the same three questions and then kind of compare the different brands based on size and speed and not necessarily understand that a company like Numaki has so much underneath the hood tech-wise to help users. And Mamaki's got, basically, I've worked with Mamaki for over 20 years and I've come to learn that they care about two things the most. They care about the overall print quality. They always strive to be the absolute best. And they also care about what they call unattended operations. They want to create technology so they don't have to sit there and babysit the printer. And this nozzle checker unit is really the kind of the core of that because it gives you that you know, people aren't going to buy a printer and necessarily do this on day one. But once you're, you're settled and you understand everything and you're running, using and employing the nozzle checker unit and the recovery system basically allows you to walk away and know that the printer is, made, is watching itself. And if it recognizes a problem, it's going to stop and, and try to fix that problem and then resume printing. And if something happens that it just can't fix the problem, then it's, it's going to stop. And so if it's five o'clock and you want to go home and there's, you want to print another 50 yards or whatever, you can let the printer go and have the confidence that this technology is monitoring it and you're not going to come in in the morning and find 50 yards of garbage and money down the drain. So they've really put a huge focus on that and uh, it's pretty impressive. It's something that you can turn on and off and that some people don't use it and I'm like, yeah, it's just... Too bad because it's it's a good feature. Um, next, we have the waveform control. This is where the ink droplets are laid down in a, I guess, spherical, um, basically a perfect circle. Um, this is where your achieve like you know the fine lines, the details, and the crispiness of the like you know the image. Um, we also have a Maki Advanced Pass system. This is where it's laid down in the know gradation tone um, this helps with the expanding or poplang in your printing um, which is very like undesirable because the print head is the most expensive piece to replace on the printer so this really helps out Mike would you like to chime in on this no I think that you know all these it all goes into the quality mm -hmm. it's not it's not just like absolute best print quality, but it's achieving quality, the absolute best print quality under everyday production circumstances. Understanding that things aren't always gonna be perfect. And so any technology, like if a nozzle drops out or two nozzles drop out, the, the, the algorithms and, the, and systems that they're using are basically masking it versus the old days, any little problem, the only solution was to slow the printer down to mask the problem. And now Mamaki has got much more advanced technology. So if a couple nozzles drop out, it's just printing away and, ma and masking it without having a print, you know, print what would be the super slow mode. Um, so it's interesting when you talk about best print quality, it's under like real everyday conditions, not lab conditions when they uh, you know, do one perfect print, but just getting best results all day long every day. Absolutely. And by the way, that going back to that nozzle checker unit, you can set the sensitivity on that. So if you don't, you don't want it to just stop and do cleanings every time one little nozzle drops out, because there's a lot of nozzles in the whole uh, print head array. So uh, you can adjust how sensitive you want it to be. Um, and with these types of systems in place, you can be a little bit more liberal and say, look, I, you know, we don't need to stop and clean every 10 minutes unless like something happens and there's like a chunk of nozzles out because this is going to take care of anything else, which is nice, much more efficient. Right. And then we also have the variable dot technology will helps you achieve like, you know, the high quality image that you want and very reduces um, less grainy images. And so we're going to talk about a, key, uh, a couple of key features of the Raster Link 7 software. Um, this helps, you know, image processing for, you know, transparent effects and gradations. There's also increased speed time of uh, PDF files by 25%. Um, we also have the variable data feature as well, which is great for um, anyone that does a lot of uniforms where you have to put your, you know, names and numbers on the back of the jersey. And we also have an improved layout. 
Um, for TX Link, we have an improvement on tone gradation um, for 16-bit rendering. And then there's also the option to create colorways within the software as well. We're going to talk about the parallel work process and this allows you to perform eight jobs within the um, parallel um, job print. Um, so you have your job one, your job two, and your job two. And you can upload every um, file for printing. Next you have your printer pool. So if you have more than one Momaki printer um, printing and you have multiple jobs, um, let's say one of the printers finished printing one file before the other, it will send your next available um, job to the next printer. And then here's just some additional resources. Um, so if you're ever looking for downloadable patterns, Pattern Room is a great source. They offer um, patterns for sportswear and activewear applications. And here are current promos for TX 300P Mark II. Well, no, that's TX 300P 1800P, our belt model, RTS 100, and RTS 55. And here's some additional resources from our speakers. Um, we have a Maki COVID-19 um, page where you can check out our COVID-19 applications. We also have a Together Reprint page where the Maki end users can register like their business and promote their services. Uh, we also have a YouTube page where you can see like our latest webinars or previously created webinars. And we also have COVID, well not COVID-19 applications, they're on there, but we have applications on how you know create different things. Um, we also have like our emails listed here. You can reach out to either one of us um, for any textile application needs questions. And then we also have six regional offices in North America, so you can always check us out. Last but not least, we're going to move into our Q and A. So, does anyone have questions? Very thorough. <laughs> Right. We also have uh, Jim Manelski here from Suma Laser Cutters, and he's just got a short presentation on uh, uh, the lasers and how they work and how that can continue to automate the whole process. 